What is going on you lot? Midi here. We get to play the brand new mode, the museum. What wonders are going to be lurking in here? Let's just get straight into it and see what we're dealing with here. There we go. Welcome. Check in here to receive your photo checklist. Use your camera to take photos of objects on the list. Who do I look like? Peter Parker to you. Okay. Photo checklist. Let's have a look. A little meat man on there. Oh no. But the pretty lady dance exterior. Marrow Melodies car graveyard. GKB636 car graveyard. What has seven arms but no head and five legs and can't walk? What? Chicken nugget. All right. So return here when I get all of the photos. Okay. All right, I forgot already what it was. Let me double check. Man, I'm going to forget all of this stuff anyway. And I hope there's no jump scares here. Reminds me of like Mortal Kombat the Crypt, you know. Examine. Boom! Okay. I said no jump scares. How did that get me? It got me. It, it was to be expected. Poor Julie. Escape hatch. When Sally, Marilyn Burns, escapes by jumping out the window, the glass was actually breakaway sugar glass made by Bob Burns and Mary Church. In fact, Mary did the stunt of jumping out the window. A mattress and some empty boxes were placed outside the window for her to land on, but setting up the shot took a long time. With the humidity of the Texas summer, the breakaway glass began to dissolve. When I went through it, I was like a glass woman because now I had little particles stuck all over me because the stuff was wet, Mary said. If they'd waited probably another 45 minutes, I don't know if there'd been any glass in those windows. Interesting. Bit of the movie stunt stuff, that's cool. How do we take a picture of this? That one's for the books. Okay. Oh, there you are. I knew you! See, I do this in-game anyway. Like, I just stand in and look at these. Look at you. Look. Wait, wait there, I'm coming in. Just no more jump scares, okay? Oh, here we go. What's the code for this? How about, wait. How am I meant to know? Is there a sprint button? Oh, there actually is a sprint button, okay. Hey, what's Connie doing out here? Hello? Booty shorts. A lot of shots were set up on the fly during principal photography by Daniel Pearl and Toby Hooper. One such shot that Hooper would years later call the best shot in the film was no exception. That shot, of course, being the iconic shot of Pam approaching the family house. Cinematographer Daniel Pearl was laying flat on a dolly with the camera tilted up. The goal of the shot was to make the house appear bigger and bigger in the frame as Pam approached it. And here's me thinking she was just stuck there. Okay. So, oh, I'm guessing it gives you maybe the code after you've completed it. That's going to be my guess. There's a lot of difference here. I thought it'd be an in-game mode where, you know, you're just walking about in third person. We had to lock the bomb due to some teenagers trying to break in. If you forgot the code, look at the cook's truck. Okay. Oh, damn, I need to turn the sensitivity up on this. Okay, so that's 546A. All right, let's go back. Okay, so 5468. Damn. Let me in. Hello? Oh yeah, I've got to take a picture of the nugget, haven't I? Let's get some lore of the chicken. Chicken Nugget. The game's composer, Ross Tregenza, used real chickens for the audio for Nugget. He luckily had a close friend and fellow composer that owned a farm with several chickens. The name Nugget was born from brand strategy lead Matthew Zepp. The name is a nod to the longtime nickname of his nephew. Nice. Well, let me take a shot of this. Gotcha. Don't worry, if there's any bone scraps in this game, you're dead. Oh no. I don't trust that at all. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You just open it up for no reason? Yeah, I don't trust that. Oh, so we got. So this is the car graveyard we're at right now. Didn't you say we got to take a picture around here? Okay, maybe not. 
Maybe it's not that. There's one of the exit gates anyway. So many people have left through, aren't they? Many Leland's teabagging at this exact spot. Hold on, we need to take a picture of it. Yeah, there it is. The teabagging spot. This one for the books. Okay. I think this was a picture I had to take. Yeah. I just remember it saying marrow in it. Bone marrow. I think there was actually one more here. Oh, here we go. Car. In one notable scene in the original film, the cook approaches the house and sees the hitchhiker. They have an altercation at the truck where the cook beats the hitchhiker with a broom handle and clearly shows off the relationship between the two characters. The reason that the scene works so well is that it's entirely real. Jim Seedow, the cook, was actually beating Ed Neal, the hitchhiker. Yeah, I told you, man. Uh, that's what it's like. But a cook does that with anyone. He just beats anyone up because the cook, man. Don't underestimate it. Just trying to see what other clues are around here. Oh, here we go. Wait. Fake hammer, real impact. The scenes in the movie with the sledgehammer seem real, and there's good reason for that. Though the prop master Bob Burns made a fake hammer with a foam rubber head, there were still complications. Leatherface actor Gunnar Hansen recalled hitting actor William Vale while filming Kirk's death scene. I was completely charged up on adrenaline, skittishly hopping back and forth as if I were speeding. So when Bill tripped and I stepped out of the shadows, I actually hit him in the face with the sledgehammer. Fake or not, it left its mark. In the pivotal dinner scene, actor Marilyn Burns, who played Sally, was actually struck and bled. I went to the bucket, said Burns, and then Grandpa hit me over the head with the other prop that was a piece of steel, a sledgehammer. That hurt. That wasn't fake. As Hansen noted, some of the blood in Sally's hair is actually Marilyn's. Ooh, interesting. Nice. What other bits of lore have we got? I'm trying to think how far we can actually go out of the map here. I think we can go towards the house here. I don't think there's any more. Oh, wait. There we go. Discreet flora. The flora around the house where most of the filming took place was populated by more than the cedar trees common to central Texas. The owners of the house were growing two acres of cannabis. They told the film crew that they could help themselves to the crop as long as they were discreet about the landlord's extracurricular gardening. According to sound recorder Ted Nicolau, I thought that was part of the reason for the confused discussions every day of what we were about to shoot. Well, they were high as hell, man. Just your daily drug activities, I guess. Let me move forward a bit. Can we actually go in the house from here? I think we can. Oh no, maybe we can't. Damn it. There's more clues to be found, I think. Oh, we actually found another clue here, randomly. During production, Gunnar Hansen was very generous to his co-stars, particularly during the chase scene. There was a shot where Sally, Marilyn Burns, was supposed to get her hair caught in a bush, but breaks herself free before Leatherface can catch her. When they shot the scene, though, Burns didn't run off as scripted. Hansen originally thought that... She wanted to linger in front of the camera a bit for her close-up. Instead of going in for the kill, Hansen began using the chainsaw to trim the bush to give Burns more time. He later discovered that his assumption about why she stopped was completely wrong. Her hair had actually been caught in the brush and she could not get free. Burns recalled to Hansen, Oh God, I thought you were going to really hurt me. When we were in the mesquite bushes and my hair was getting caught, well, you couldn't see through your stupid mask and... I don't know if that was a trick or not, but I was told you couldn't see, and you couldn't see where you were going. So I had to hurry and get out of there fast. I'm thinking, he's really going to get me. Plus, you were damn scary. Oh, we missed one in the car graveyard. Wait, right here. Car radio. The song on the radio when the hitchhiker is picked up in the van is Roger Bartlett's Fool for a Blonde. Bartlett has said that Toby Hooper chose the song because he thought the hitchhiker was a fool for Sally. He's a fool, man. 
Tea bags a lot as well. So what was our next one anyway? We needed to get here. Uh, JKB636. I'm guessing that's the number plate. One don't have one. Which one's this? Ooh, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Hey, listen. I'm all one for checklists. I think that's every interaction out here. I did run around quite a bit, and I didn't actually see anything else. And obviously, you can't go towards the house. I did look. All right, let's just go towards the house, then. So what have we got left? We've got... White Seven Arms and Pretty Lady, so that's going to be all outside, I think. What do you guys think, though? Do you think this should have been a third-person mode where you can actually just run around and look at the map? Because that's what I thought was happening. Sort of like a free-roam thing. Oh, I can see the face up there. Okay. We haven't checked down here, though. I'm just, like, expecting something to happen, you know? A big jump scare. I ain't one for them, unfortunately. Actually, nothing can hear. I turned up the sensitivity a little bit. Now, guys, this is on the PS4. Bear in mind, okay? The graphically... Not really going to be that optimized. This is what you're going to get if you want to see it early, you know. Here we go. Okay, nothing in here. Ooh, never mind. This. Stop and turn. Gunnar Hansen's stop and turn move was an accident. The boots that Gunnar Hansen wore had three-inch lifts to make him taller. Though because of this, if he didn't stop suddenly and then turn, he would lose his balance and fall. The weight of the chainsaw also impacted his movements due to its sheer weight. So after falling on the first take, Gunner stopped, turned, and one of Leatherface's signature moves was born. Kim Henkel would call it the Keystone move. The shot of his signature move was recreated in the unrated gameplay trailer of our game. Interesting. Three-inch boots. I'm going to need them, though. Let me know where I can get a pair of them. Shout out to all the short people here. So the front field and lever face. There he is. Look at him. This is the photo spot. Okay. Let's see what actually happens if I click him. Oh, swap. Wait, what? Let's take a picture of him first. Okay, maybe I've got to swap with him. Oh, he's just switching screens. Okay. Switch to the one that I'm actually already using. Okay, so how do you get him to... Uh him to move. That's part of the challenge, right? Pretty... Oh, pretty lady dance. Oh, okay. That's actually part of the skin. Switch that. Did this one? Was the pretty lady? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah. I never use it. It's like one of the skins I never use. Unfortunately. Listen. You know the one I'm using. Oh, there we go. Oh, there's got to be something for this. The little armadillo. The opening shot. The armadillo in the opening shot of the film was an actual armadillo that production designer Robert Burns found on the side of the road and taxidermied himself. According to Robert Burns, the original script called for a shot of a dead dog on the side of the road, and then the camera would pan to the green van. After further thought, Toby Hooper felt a dog was too domesticated to show in that light and deemed it too horrible for audiences. This is when an armadillo was decided to be their best bet, as it fit as a symbol for Texas. Robert Burns then found a dead armadillo on the side of the road and took it home himself to taxidermy the animal. This is how the opening shot of the film was born. Oh, there you go. Let's actually check over it just in case we missed anything here. Oh, imagine if you could leave. Okay, so in the front field somewhere, there's actually meant to be something we need. Oh, that's it. What the? What is this? Hey there! Oh. <laughs> why, Johnny? Why? Why would he appear like that? God damn it. Okay, now we can hear. Little mini Johnny jump scare there. It's to be expected, right? So we've got everything we need now. Let's go back to the checkboard. What is my reward? Okay, so I've got the stamp. Oh, there we go. 1973. I'm guessing that's the code for the door. Okay. Oh, here we go. Inside the house. Nine, seven, oh, okay. A 
we get a new checklist here. Skull Wall, Family Dinner, Crisp Kringle, Grandpa's Arm Candy, Frames of Fear. Okay. Actually quite a lot here. Yeah. Oh, we've actually got items to put here. Okay. I'm guessing I probably have to find everything first before I take a picture of this. Okay, then we got... Ooh, can we actually go down? Into the basement? Okay, it's going to be another code. Oh, I'm guessing it's going to be the same thing. We have to do the checklist here. This. Blood spatter. One of the reasons that blood and gore are limited in the film is because Toby Hooper and Kim Henkel felt that fear and intensity were more important. According to screenwriter Kim Henkel, he and Toby Hooper reached out to the MPAA to discuss the guidelines to avoid getting slapped with an X rating. Apparently, the investors of the film were terrified that the film would get an X rating, so all these thoughts were front of mind during production. Ultimately, Hooper and Henkel's original vision of inflicting fear and intensity with the gore and blood implied worked to the film's benefit and made a bigger impact. All right. That's just how it is, man. You know, they want to have the fear in the games, not so much the gore. You overkill it, then what? What the? Oh, here we go. Add it to the inventory. I just want to like wander around first. Yeah, look, you can go in this way. I don't trust that. Every time I open it, I'm expecting a jump scare. What was the checklist? So we got skull wall. Family dinner. Okay, let's actually check family dinner. I actually walked straight past that. Possible titles. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre wasn't the first or even second title of the film. The first two working titles were Head Cheese and Leatherface. Head Cheese was the first working title of the film, though, for most of principal photography. Leatherface was the working title until late into production when it was finally given the official title of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Kim Hinkle and Toby Hooper intended for the title to be spelled Chainsaw, but once the press were sent information on the film, and when the original poster was produced, the spelling got twisted into Chainsaw. So the movie at one point was going to be called Head Cheese. Okay, let, let, let's just sink in for a minute. Cheap Thrills. Screenwriter Kim Henkel has said that one of the reasons he and Toby Hooper wanted to make a horror film was their limited budget. If you have relatively little money, what are your possibilities? Henkel says. The clear answer was some sort of genre piece. Horror was the easiest because we felt that we didn't have to have any names in the cast. Production values weren't nearly so important as in some other realms, so it became the natural choice. Kim and Toby Before Texas. Kim Hankel and Toby Hooper met during the filming of Hooper's 1969 film Eggshells. Four years later, they would go on to create the production company Vortex Inc. and co-create the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Another Texas Chainsaw actor was also part of the Eggshells cast. Alan Danziger, better known as Jerry to Chainsaw fans, co-starred in the earlier film. Near they are. Oh, having dinner. Sorry, we gotta get a picture of this. The dinner scene. The infamous dinner scene was a long, trying shoot. Plastic surgeon W.E. Barnes created the makeup for Grandpa, and it took nearly 10 hours to apply to actor John Dugan. A lot of pieces and parts went into creating Grandpa's look. But because they were down to their last set of makeup parts, the crew had to shoot every scene involving Grandpa all in one day. The grueling shoot was one of the hottest days of the production, with temperatures over 100 degrees. The set windows were blacked out with black plastic in a house filled with cameras and lights that reached as high as 120 degrees inside. Because of the extreme heat on set, the food at the dinner table started to rot. The smell on set was ghastly for the entire cast and crew. All of the bones on the set were real, and combined with the lights that made them burn, released an unbearable smell. The combination of the stench with the extreme heat made a lot of the crew sick, and they take frequent trips outside to throw up. In the end, 
The brutal set brought a real rawness to the film. The shoot in total lasted nearly 32 hours for some of the crew. That poor grandpa, man. Stuck in all that heat, weren't you? And all them Leelands. And all that, all that. Think about how much you've gone through. How many bone knives you've had to endure, man. I'm, I'm sorry. Truly, I am. Oh, you can actually switch it. Okay, look. Be serious, eh? There we go. Keep it uh, accurate, you know? I just have to take a picture of this, right? Oh, that don't work. Family dinner. Skin lampshades. Why was the film marketed as being based on true events? According to Kim Henkel, the film's marketing of being based on true events evolved over production. The famous crawl, for instance, was implemented to mark the story as an historical event that was more captivating, but wasn't meant to be taken seriously. Another inspiration for the story were tales Toby Hooper was told by his family as a young child. They told him stories of a killer from Wisconsin that would use human skin for lampshades. This Wisconsin killer was the infamous Ed Gein. Yeah, that's right. I always thought that's basically what it was based on, Ed Gein. Okay, so I'm guessing I have to actually put something here to finish this, maybe? But wait, what? What is it that goes there? Let's go find it. Makeup set. Gunnar Hansen shared a lot of praise for his fellow cast members. In the 40th anniversary Blu-ray releases audio commentary, Hansen notes that actor Jim Sedow, the cook, was probably the only actor in the movie who could look benign and then become extremely evil without any makeup. That's the cook for you, man. You, you don't ever underestimate the cook. Oh, here we go. What the is this? Perfect. There we go. That's the scene. Get my picture. On. Guys, what's going on? I don't. I don't ever think you wanted me. Oh no. He's missing an item as well. <laughs> How can I forget? Oh, we actually find him more as we go along. He really cut her. According to Gunnar Hansen, he really cut Marilyn Burns' finger in the infamous grandpa feeding scene. The prop knife, designed to pump out fake blood, wouldn't work after several takes. Finally, when no one was looking, Gunnar Hansen removed the tape from the knife that made it dull and really cut Marilyn's finger. Knowing this, that would mean that actor John Dugan Grandpa sucked on the actual blood of Marilyn Burns. Damn, he was crazy. So we still need an item to go on Lev Face anyway. Let's keep looking around. It's actually quite a lot to actually look at here. Ashtray. Actors are paid varying amounts for their work in film. For his voiceover in the opening monologue of the film, John Larroquette was paid with a single joint. Recent reports, however, suggest that his rate has gone up. I only want you to join. Friend of Leatherface. Since both of her parents were working on the film, three-year-old Karina Nicola was often on set and struck up a friendship with Leatherface actor Gunnar Hansen. He recalled their interactions. She had never liked my Leatherface mask. She was sitting with me one day while I waited for a shot set up. When Dottie, makeup artist Dorothy J. Pearl, came to put on my mask, it horrified Karina. As soon as it covered my face, she started screaming. I had Dottie pull it off. See, I said, it's just me. She calmed down, but when I put the mask on again, she started screaming again. I realized she was too young to make the leap. To see my transformation from Gunner to Leatherface and understand that I was still under the mask. So I made sure she never saw me in the mask after that. At least until the unfortunate meat hook scene. Uh, that would scar me for life. Imagine coming out. <laughs> That's the sort of thing my dad would have done. Like wholeheartedly, he would have just put that mask on. But see, the difference is he wouldn't have took it off. He would have just left it on. There we go. Genuine bone furnishings. The bones used for props were real animal bones found at a veterinarian bone yard and a cattle pasture. Art director Robert Burns led the charge of designing most of the bone props, like furniture and light fixtures. Oh, 
Oh, what? I've just noticed that. I think that's actually one of the pictures. Yeah. The clues in the name, you know. There's another one here. Scaring a child. In the original movie shoot, the caterer, Sally Nicolau, was married to the location sound recordist, Ted Nicolau. The day they shot the meat hook scene, Sally brought their then three-year-old daughter, Karina, to set when she was delivering lunch. Unfortunately, little Karina saw Terry McMinn, Pam, on the meat hook and began crying and screaming. Her father recalled, I was in the living room while we were shooting that scene, and she came running in and skidded to a stop and just went completely white, started screaming and crying, and went running out of the house. I think in here, okay. I'm still not trusting these, man. Like, when is something actually going to pop up? That's what I want to know. We'll go outside in a minute. I want to check upstairs. We get up here. Oh! I knew it was going to happen. What? What is... Why are they always Julie? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, to be fair, look, this is who I would have picked. Who do you want to keep seeing dead in the game? You know, for the museum mode. I'd go Julie. I'd say it straight away. One outfit, 32 days. Actors only had one set of their wardrobe. The actors had to wear the same clothing for the entire 32-day shoot, 12 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week. For fear of fading or being damaged, they couldn't wash the clothes. So the actors wore the same clothes unwashed for 32 days straight, in 95 to 100 degree Texas heat. According to the crew, Gunnar Hansen stunk of body odor worse than anyone on set by the end of the shoot. Oh, damn. There's even some people that still do that to this day, and they are the sweaty players of this game. Yep. You, you heard it here first. Ooh, here we go. Quick soda. This reminds me of Fallout straight away. Oh, so I can't even... Okay. That's something we've got to take a picture of. I'm going to take a picture of it anyway. Actually. There we go. You never know. I don't like that. Um, let's have a look. Let's go to Hitchhiker's bedroom. Oh, here we go. Hey, can I take that? Oh, I can take that. Creepier, innit? We can there? Ooh, here we go. I don't know why, but I'm just expecting Hitchhiker to like pop out for some reason. Oh, okay. This is where we put the pictures. Go, and then we're missing two more. Oh, look at that one. They're facing Julie. Oh, that's a nice picture. Oh, I can even take a picture of that. Just never know, do you? What oh, is another one? They're all Julie. That's hilarious. Every single one is Julie. Okay, so we just need one more for that. Is there anything in Hitchhiker's bedroom? Gold wall, family dinner, grandpa's arm candy. In Grandpa's room. I didn't even know he had one. In a red room. Hitchhiker's camera. The make and model of the Hitchhiker's camera is a Polaroid Automatic 230 Land camera. It was manufactured and distributed from 1967 to 1969. This camera previously belonged to Maria Flores. The Hitchhiker stole it after she was stalked and kidnapped by Johnny. Ooh, Hitchhiker, man. What's your problem? Stealing other people's things like this. No living animals were harmed. Initially, art director Robert Burns wanted set pieces of real dead cats and dogs. The crew acquired dead animal carcasses from a veterinarian and actually tried to embalm them with formaldehyde. Makeup artist and production assistant Dorothy Pearl, at the time the wife of the film's cinematographer Daniel Pearl, was injecting a dead animal with formaldehyde when she accidentally injected into her own leg through the animal. 
Toby Hooper then ordered that the dead animal carcasses had to be thrown out. The crew poured gasoline to cremate them, but the stench from the smoke from the bonfire started to make its way into the family house and added to an already foul stench set. Jesus. Everything was going wrong, wasn't it? One thing after another. Oh, here we go. You never know when you need a hand, you know? Oh dear. Grandpa's room closed for renovations. Of course it is. Two cases here. Sissy's straight razor. After Kim Henkel and creative director Ronnie Hobbs finished designing Sissy's look and backstory, the only question left was what type of weapon would she carry? According to Kim's secret catalog of character concepts, he always envisioned Sissy wielding some type of straight razor, a small, portable weapon that could stay hidden until just the right time. It's petite and deadly, just like Sissy. It fit her personality perfectly. So even though the hitchhiker carries it in the original 1974 film, it did in fact previously belong to Sissy. As far as what happened to her, or where Sissy is during the 1974 film, well, that's a story for another time. I actually think the weapon does suit Sissy, to be honest with you. Hitchhiker's pocket knife. This weapon is a nod to everyone's favorite unlikable character, Franklin, from the 1974 film. According to creative director Ronnie Hobbs and designer Rob Fox, they knew the likelihood of Franklin ever appearing in the video game was slim to none, so this was their way of including him as a small Easter egg. Oh, guys, come on. We knew this. We knew it was happening. Jim Seedow's toughest scene to get right was the broomstick clubbing at the gas station. Since the prop was an actual wooden broom handle, he was afraid of hurting his fellow actor in the scene. After several takes of it looking fake, Seedow really struck his fellow actor in the final take. It was an exhausting shoot for everyone, but Marilyn Burns had it as bad as anyone on set. She did several takes of diving through the doorway of the gas station, and each time she would land knee first on the hard concrete floor so many times that the floor tore up and severely bruised her knees. That's everyone's weapon in here. All the ones we can see so far, okay. Let's go check that creepy room. Let's just save that till last, really. Oh! oh! Oh man, yeah, you knew it. Just why you gotta do this to me, huh? Just take the item. Let me get out. Box office success. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre grossed over 30 million at the box office in North America and sold over 16 million tickets. With inflation, the film would have made over 150 million in box office earnings today. Ooh. Give me a bit of that money. Spring of 73. Kim Henkel and Toby Hooper spent January and February of 1973 writing the script, but production moved on rather quickly after that. They were shooting the movie by summer of 1973. Oh, production manager so. Ron Bozeman would go on to work on another film that featured cannibalism. In 1992, he won an Academy Award as a producer for The Silence of the Lambs. Okay, I think we're done here, aren't we? I knew something was coming. <laughs> I knew something was happening. Let me get out. Guys, jump scares actually get me The really Apprehension bad. Engine. Gun Interactive's own Wes Keltner led the direction of music for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre game. One day, Wes was at home brainstorming, and in the background, he had 2015's The Witch playing. He wasn't watching the film, but was more listening to it. The sounds and music in the film struck him as he was listening. He asked himself, what instruments are they using to make those unique sounds? It turned out, those sounds were created by an Apprehension Engine. Wes was able to track down Tony Dugan Smith, who makes roughly six of these instruments a year, and was informed that the apprehension engine took around seven months to build. 
West then had the honor to have a meeting with film composer and creator of music for the witch, Mark Corvin. It was at this meeting where Corvin said, forget everything you know about playing guitar and other instruments. Approach the apprehension engine like a child and experience and discover. From there, the direction of sounds for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre game were born. I was going to say that, that music just, yeah, it just sounds like something you've never really heard before. Well, from my experience anyway. Ashtray. Okay, so we've, we've actually seen this. I don't think we've seen this one. Preparing for the role. To prepare for the role of Leatherface, Gunnar Hansen went to Austin State School, which was a 95-acre residential and training facility for adults with developmental disabilities. He was there several days to pick up the residents' mannerisms and how they walked and talked. It was important to Gunnar to portray the character authentically, without making a mockery of those who suffer from developmental disabilities. Okay, so what have we actually got? So we've got Skull Wall, Family Dinner, Grandpa's Arm Candy. So we can't get into the Grandpa's room yet. Frames of Fear and Revoked Licenses. What have we got in the infantry, actually? Me. Okay, so we still need another picture. Let's go here, actually. Wait. Try and put the pieces back that we had. So, the plate here. They've actually got to be in position, so there we go. They're facing on the right. And there's still something actually missing over there. Is it another plate? What will go here? Something else I'm actually missing. Okay. We keep looking. Oh, I know. We've not gone outside, have we? See, this is where you'd probably catch Sunny in here. Just somewhere over there in the corner. See anything in here? No. Yeah, we haven't actually checked down here. Easy to lose track, guys, all right? Okay, here we go. Ah, oh, there we go. There's the plate. Oh, yeah, okay. There's one of the pictures. Okay, wait. Oh, we got another one for the license, please. Oh, no. I have no idea where I'm going to find them. I don't even have one. We've got a few more things. Oh, here we go. Take one. Examine these quickly. Toby meets the cook. Director Toby Hooper offered the part of the old man, the cook, to Jim Seedow after they worked together in the 1971 film The Wind Splitter. They were both a part of the cast in said film. Hooper and Seedow weren't the only Texas Chainsaw Massacre alumni to work on The Wind Splitter. Ron Bozeman was the key grip, Kim Henkel was credited as the grip. And Sally Richardson was the assistant director. Oh, right, she lights up, but leave that on. Are they all in here? I think they are. News of the day. Toby Hooper wanted to parody the news reports of the day which he considered televised lies, and so devised the opening voiceover, famously recited by actor John Larroquette. Well, have I actually collected enough here? Let's see. Ooh, I think we have. And then we take a picture of them. No? Maybe they spell something actually, so like, what have we got? M... Let me actually spell this. So E... is it... Wait, hold on. M, E, A... No, what's the last one we got? T... Me. Oh, okay. Okay. 
I mean, kind of worked it out somehow. <laughs> I don't even know. I was like, it's got to add up to something, right? God damn. All right, so that's that done. So we've got Grandpa's Arm Candy, Frames of Fear. So we're still missing a frame, which I'm going to guess is still in Hitchhiker's Bedroom, maybe? Maybe we didn't fully look in here. I missed one accidentally. Guys, this is hard, man. I feel like I'm... Oh, here we go. I feel like I'm doing an Easter egg. Put this one on here. Oh, if we actually got to put them in order, I think. Why is there so many pictures of the Cook and Lev face? Just literally, look. Trying to figure out if it shows you the order here. Oh, okay, okay, I think I get it. Maybe it's something like this. Right, let's take them all. I'm guessing they have to go in some sort of order, right? So the first one, where is it? Be these guys where they're at there, and then the next one would be Julie. He gets captured. He goes on the meat hook. And then me. Bang. Okay, we figured it out. I know. I'm a genius. Who would have thought it, eh? Right, so that's that done. What have we got? We've got Skull Wall, Family Dinner, Grandpa's Arm Candy. Okay. So I think we can do the others now because I've collected enough. So let's go back in here. There's the plate. Get a picture of all these together. Say cheese, guys. Say me. Say head cheese. Balls. Don't worry, Cook. I'm coming back for you, mate. I'm going to be teabagging you. Like, don't worry about it. We'll be back. Okay, and the skull wall. Does it matter where they go? Oh, it does. Picture right here. So... A look. Okay. Ram skull goes up there. Yeah, and the last one's here. I think that's right. Yep. There we go. The skull wall. Cool. So now, though, Grandpa's arm. Arm candy. How do we get the code for the room? We actually need to go into the room. It has some sort of code on it, right? Oh, no. Oh, it does. Oh, okay. And I'm guessing that is what the code was. It was me. Oh, here we go. I know it. This is where he is. Little room. Do not feed Grandpa. Okay. The chair for grandma's rocking chair the remains of the mummified grandma or even any mention of grandma was not in the original script art director bob burns added her into the set to show that there were women in the family's history mm. the hitchhiker's origins according to actor edwin neal he based his performance of the hitchhiker on his nephew who suffered from paranoid schizophrenia. He's I am. Ah, here we go. Take the arm. It's the only thing I have left in my inventory. Oh! I know it. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> ah, I should have read the sign. Ah, god damn it. Is me thinking you was on my side, Granddad. Never was. Okay, so we've done all of that now. I think I've covered everything up here. I want to try and do like a complete walkthrough of it for you lot. Let's have a look. Stamp the checklist. We've made progress. Okay, sweet. So... Yeah, wait, hold on. So, okay, show me the grape soda. So do I have to collect the soda upstairs? Just no more jump scares, please, guys. Like, I'm at my end. I'm at my wit's end with this. You always got to get me the jump scares every time. Is there, like, some sort of code on here or something? Oh, there we go. Look. 
One nine three nine. Okay, check the one down here. I don't think we did. Only like really at the start. Oh, there we go. Okay. So it was one nine. Wait, what was it? Oh my God, I just like lost track. Oh, three nine. That was it. My memory's so bad. Open up. We've been here many times in the old basement. The classic. Many people have been destroyed. Okay, so we've got a new checklist. Killing time. Big headed hamburger. Frozen finger food. Okay. At least... You know what, guys? This basement took me so long to learn in the game. No joke. I think I was, like, getting up to level 60 and I still didn't know the basement. Oh, we got the heads. Leatherface mask. The holes and markings on the forehead of Leatherface's masks represent a hammer to the head. Back then, cows were slaughtered in the head with a sledgehammer. So the holes appear on the forehead of Leatherface's masks to show continuity with how actual cattle were slaughtered. I need to put something there. Oh, we got used items here. Leatherface speaks. In the original script, the infamous dinner scene was quite different. Leatherface had scripted, though completely unintelligible, lines. As Gunnar Hansen recalls, they were written out. His first line is, A a e o u u u bur, and then, A be go ba a ji i ma. According to Toby Hooper, these lines had actual meaning behind them. Hansen's script notes pointed out that the first line meant roughly, How are you? Welcome home. Supper's almost ready. The next line meant, I've been a good boy. I got them all. It was like someone in solo queue just putting in their mic and talking. There we go. I'll take that for later. Thank you. I needed three things. Mask, out. prop, or wardrobe for the role of Leatherface. When Gunnar Hansen had his first meet and greet for the role of Leatherface, Toby Hooper and Kem Hankel were impressed with his size and stature. When Gunnar walked through the doorway into their meeting, Hooper noticed how much space of the doorway Gunnar took up. They knew right away that Gunnar had the physical traits for the iconic role. Oh, I've actually cornered off someone to map here. Real torture. During Sally's torture scene, her screams ultimately led her to shout, I'll do anything you want, which Marilyn Burns later recollected was the dirtiest thing you could say. It was pretty damn serious. Nowadays, it comes out of everybody's mouth. Now they're doing it for free. They're jumping into it. But in those days, I'll do anything you want. You just didn't say that. You never said that. Burns continues, though, that Sally's torturers, the Slaughter family, don't comprehend that because it's not the result they desire. Rather, she feels that they're so sexually repressed that they can only manifest desire as sadistic cruelty. What makes them even more horrific is the sense that they gather excitement by watching women suffer. I can tell. That's why I can keep seeing the Julies around the map. Like the soundtrack, though. Behind the scenes photo, Bull. During research production for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre game, Gun Interactive's creative director Ronnie Hobbs, executive producer Ishmael Vicens, and brand strategy lead Matthew Zepp traveled to dozens of locations in rural Texas. Thousands of photos were taken to capture the essence and authenticity of the Texas countryside. During one of these trips, the team at Gun stumbled onto a farmhouse they thought was abandoned. But little did they know, they would meet a new friend. A massive bull in a nearby gated field with horns that stretched four feet end to end. However, the gate itself was not closed, so the team from Gun found themselves face to face and only five feet on the other side of this open gate with this giant freak of nature. The Gun crew were initially terrified, but they carefully and meticulously walked around the fence while keeping their eyes on this massive creature. They were able to shut the gate and any crisis was thankfully avoided. You know what? This just made me think of something, right? Imagine if you had something like this in the game. Just like an animal interaction where like even if a victim or family member walked near it, it would go off. Kind of like Nugget, you know, he's like alerts him. Or it maybe it attacks him or something. Like for either rule. Ah, that'd be quite cool. Alright. See what else we can find down here. 
Ooh, we got the chainsaws. <laughs> oh, that brings back memories. How about this one? That is like, that noise is just manifested in my head for a very long time, you know? Banned in the UK. The film was banned in over 10 countries, including Great Britain and Germany. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre managed to have screenings in London, England in late 1974. But by February of 1975, the BBFC decided to ban the film. As they were uncomfortable about the threats toward the film's climax and the explicit use of abnormal psychology, and refused to even give the film an X rating. In 1982, the former Prime Minister of England, Margaret Thatcher, along with socially conservative activist Mary Whitehouse, formed the Video Nasties, which led to the banning of several horror films in the United Kingdom. Additionally, in the early years of Prime Cable, channels like HBO refused to air the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Many cable channels avoided the film at all costs. Hey, listen. Nothing to do with me, right? I didn't do nothing. That was what it was like. I mean, even when I was younger, I used to play games like Resident Evil 2, Carmageddon. You know, they were almost banned. They were definitely banned in Germany. They used to ban a lot of stuff like that. But yeah, England was the same for some reason. They don't ask me, man. I would have revoked that shit straight away. Okay, we're in the layer though, West Tunnel. I swear to God, Johnny, you better not jump scare me. Whoa, oh my God. Actually tripped me out of it there. Didn't expect the head to be there like in my face. Side garden tunnel. I can actually go right to the end here. No ladder though. Can actually go around, okay. Nice little lay out the basement though, ain't it? Not as difficult, is it, when you finally learn the whole basement in a game? I feel like when the newer maps come out, I'll just get used to them now. Okay, no jump scare. How the music is made. Numerous instruments used by Wayne Bell to create the music were children's musical toys. According to Bell, many of the instruments used to create the music of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre were cymbals, xylophones, and shakers. Being that Bell is a drummer, a substantial number of cymbals were used. The audio team also used Bell's K stand-up five-string bass with a movable bridge which allowed them to change how high off the board the strings are. This brought out the strong sounds of the bass. Additionally, the sound team used a bow, plucking and rubbing various items on it. Check the fuse basement exit. It's not obviously not going to be here because it's more based on the film. Oh, there's just a door there instead. I wonder if that was what would be there instead. Oh no, of course not. It wouldn't make sense, would it? One door instead of a fuse exit. The family would go wild. Imagine it. So what is the things here? So killing time, rear basement. Peak headed bad dancer with a killer arm. Hamburger. Frozen finger food. Okay. Be on the lookout. Oh. This. My farm. Imagine a killer with a knife farm. That'd be so good. Oh, mate. I'm just finding FAQ. Okay. Masks. The leather face masks would become iconic but they were hard to see through. Gunnar Hansen explained, the masks had one unfortunate feature. Their eye holes were small. They fit snugly, but not around my eyes. And the further the eye holes were from my face, the less I could see. It was like looking down a long tube. I could see only what was directly in front of me. All natural masks. Art director Bob Burns performed a significant amount of trial and error to perfect the Leatherface mask. Ultimately, he landed on liquid latex and thin insulation, which aged naturally and yellowed. Interesting. Okay, so 
Maybe go to the cold room, because that's where one of the photos are anyway. It's actually been down here, haven't we? Ooh, another code here. Alright. Playing with fire. Early on during filming, Gunnar Hansen asked Toby Hooper, how are we going to shoot the scene where I get chainsawed in the leg? Toby Hooper replied, I don't know, but don't worry about it because it's the last shot of the movie. For the climactic ending of the film, the crew wrapped a metal sheet around Gunnar Hansen's leg with a stake taped to it and a blood bag taped on top of that. Originally, he thought it was a crew member who would run the chainsaw cutting into Gunner's leg. But Gunner insisted he would do it himself for fear of the crew member accidentally sawing his leg. The saw didn't have its actual teeth attached to it, so they had to make modifications to the saw itself. At first, Gunner thought he had sawed his leg, but his leg did become badly burned from sawing into the metal plate that was protecting it. Clam of fire, huh? Crazy, I'm still getting lost to this day, ain't I? Please stop using the freezer to store your lunch leftovers. Lock code reminder. Bones, bracelet, cast body. Bones, bracelet, cast body. I'm guessing that's four, right? Unless it's all in this room, maybe it is. Oh, it's a number, right? Eight. And it's free, right? Oh no, it's the hand, right? Yeah, free. Bones was four, bracelet, the cast. Two. Okay, so the bones was four, the bracelet was three. Three, two, eight, okay. There we go. Oh, that one weren't too bad. Frozen finger food. There we go. So hand burger is in the basement storage. Filling time, rear basement. You just got to kind of look at where the locations are. I think in the west tunnel. Pretty sure. Skin. The practical effects of Leatherface's skin mask proved a difficult challenge for Bob Burns, the art director for the film. Mary Church, who had multiple responsibilities on the original film, including continuity and stunt coordination, noted that Bob spent weeks trying to come up with just homemade varieties of stuff that sort of looked like dried skin. I remember him being concerned about expression, or not being able to do expression, and that there probably needed to be other expressions maybe on the face. Just making sure I've not left anything here, really. Rear basement and basement storage. Okay, so rear basement says killing time. Is it just the clock? Okay, it is. That's killing time. So we've got pig-headed bad dancer with a killer arm. I think that's that body in there. So hamburger is in basement storage. Where is the hamburger, eh? Oh, there we go. Wait. Oh, I've actually got to put something in here. Wait, wait a minute. Ah, uh, okay. So, oh, I figured it out. In you go. It reminds me of Silent Hill for some reason. There we go. Right, so. Pig headed. Bad dancer with a killer arm. Music's pretty cool. We're vibing with the music right now. Oh, we need to check this one out. There it is, Biggie. Alright, so we put the pig's head on there. There we go. Get the picture. Done. Okay. What's left now? Oh, that's it. Alright. Let's get our stamp. Our stamp 
that is well rewarded. To be fair, I'm doing this quicker than I thought. A lot quicker than I thought. Okay, so the clue for the code is going to be on a chainsaw and a stamp. And the chainsaws. There they were. Okay, they're right here. Did it matter which one? I uh, figured out already. It's based on the uh, chainsaw attacks. Here we go. Okay, so that's four. One. Three. Two. There you go. I don't know if you guys ever used to do like puzzles and easter eggs back in the day. I mean, to be fair, I'm lucky I'm even figuring this out. I'm not the brightest. But clues, they, I don't know, it just appears to me sometimes. Okay, so where is the exit all the way down here? Is it by this door or is it on the other side? No, it was on the other side, wasn't it? Take the long way round. go. So what was the code? Can you imagine if I forgot? Four, one, three, two. We win. Let me in. I need to escape now. Let me out. I swear I just heard a noise. Help! Help me! I'm coming, I'm coming. Where the... Yeah, if you show up shouting, sure. You. I didn't want to die. Please. All right. Got me. Maria got me killed. I knew it. But it's like that is what it's like in this game. It's crazy that the ending was actually what it's like in solo queue. You're minding your own business, you're doing your own thing, someone comes up to you, solo queuer. Help me, help me, help me. One's in your way, gets in your way, left face catcher. That is a very accurate representation of it. Oh, and we got a big red button. What's this do? Ooh, so we get some more bonus things here. Can we change that? Okay, so Hitchhiker can get... Who does Hitchhiker normally get in the game whenever there is someone? Normally the Connie. Their face, what are you doing, bro? Oh, it's actually... There are these big red buttons. Oh, you can just change them. <laughs> yeah, that's what we want. That's what we really want. There you go, Cook. Right where you belong. I'm guessing this is more of like a photo mode now. Okay. I think that was pretty much everything. Oh, I'm going to use some of these red buttons around the map. Oh, there he is. Putting these strap right in the door frame. Hey, not, not many people use that spot anymore, do they? It's more like for Nancy. Who do we actually want jumping out the window? That'd be... No, that'd be Anna, of course. Come on now. Anna's going to be the only one jumping out that window. I guess there might be a few more red buttons around the map. Oh, there is. Let's follow it all the way to the exit, then. Oh, I didn't actually get this one, my bad. Stretch of road. Gunnar Hansen had several weeks to physically prepare for his role as Leatherface. I started walking in my neighborhood before dawn but quickly tired of the dogs chasing me. So I found a field, paced off a mile, and then started walking and jogging. 
Soon I was jogging that mile, and eventually I could run the entire distance. Oh, look at that. Perfect. Who we got? No, we want the cook. Goodbye, Leland. That right there? Wait. This is the money shot, as they call it. <laughs> wait for it, wait for it. Here we go. Money shot. Look at that. That should be the thumbnail, should it not? That's brilliant. Yeah, lovely. See if there's anything towards the exit here. Just love face. Oh. Guys, that was pretty much everything for the museum mode. I think a lot of you were expecting you to walk around the map. Maybe that could be a thing that they implement in the future, I hope. Some sort of like free roam mode. But for people that are fans of the movie, you know, it is really cool to walk around that map, to learn about the movie and some interesting facts about it. I think it's quite cool. You guys can let me know what you thought about the museum mode and the jump scares. Of course, the jump scares are going to get me. And I'm glad I actually finished it, yeah? So you can use this if you ever want to go in there and you get stuck. Guys, I just thought I'd throw in a little bonus Easter egg here for you guys getting towards the end of the video. Here you go. We found him. It is natural habitat. Look at that. Beautiful. See you a lot later.